Hello everyone. Thank you for joining our support webinar series today on topics of how to correctly interpret your RNA scope images. My name is Connie Zhang, a senior technical support scientist here at ACD. At today's webinar, my colleagues Sardar and Amber are here to co-present with me and they will spend most of the time with you explaining in-depth um, image analysis. Before we begin, I have a couple of announcements. First, the audio will be muted for the duration of the webinar. If you have a question, please use the Q&A section to the right of the WebEx window. Our technical support scientists will be able to address your questions in real time. In the event we have not addressed your question, we will follow up with you offline after the webinar. Second, the webinar is being recorded, so in the event you cannot stay for the whole duration of the webinar, we'll have the recording up on the website and you can listen to it at a later time. With that said, I would like to begin with our webinar. Here's a list of topics we're going to cover today. I'll start with a brief introduction of RNA scope technology, followed by some basic concept and methodology available for RNA scope data analysis. I will then pass the presentation to my colleagues Sardar and Amber to discuss in more details about image acquisition, image analysis, as well as the internal data analysis workflow by Farmer Assay Services team. RNA-Scope is a novel in-situ hybridization in each technology with a unique probe design that allows simultaneous signal amplification and background noise suppression to achieve single molecule detection at a single cell level while preserving tissue morphology. RNA scope assay works virtually for any genome, any gene, and in any tissue. The technology consists of three major parts a unique target probe that ACD designs against your sequence of interest, a signal amplification system that amplifies the signal with a high signal to noise ratio, and lastly, visualization of single RNA molecules as punctate dots. RNA scope assay allows either fluorescent or chromogenic labeling and is compatible with a variety of sample types, including FFPE and frozen tissue as well as cell lines. The double ZZ probe design is the key feature of RNA scope technology. The bottom of the Z is a 50 way sequence that is complementary to your target sequence of interest, whereas the top of the double ZZ serves as pre amplifier binding site where the signal amplification cascade occurs. A standard RNA scope probe is a pool of 20 ZZ probe oligos that covers a 1 kb region of your target sequence, which is selected based on our proprietary probe design algorithm. Here is a schematic diagram showing the hybridization and the subsequent amplification of the RNA scope assay. Once the double ZZ probe binds, it serves as a foundation and binding site for the pre amplifier molecule. Upon pre amplifier binding, a cascade of signal amplification will occur, also known as building an amplification tree. If a single Z binds to target mRNA transcript, the pre-amplifier won't bind 
as it needs both CZs to provide a binding site. This helps to ensure the specificity of the probes and helps reduce potential background staining. Here is an overview of the RNA scope workflow. The RNA scope methodology starts with permeabilizing the sample with pretreatment kit, followed by probe hybridization and signal amplification that was described in the previous slide. At the end of the assay, RNA molecules can be visualized under the microscope as punctic dots, which can then be quantified. This is the part that we're going to be focusing on during today's webinar. Before diving into image analysis, this slide summarizes all the assays that, that are currently available from ACD, ranging from chromogenic singleplex and duplex to multiplex fluorescent as well as base scope, singleplex, and duplex assay. Today, we'll be discussing in more details uh, on how to quantify both chromogenic and fluorescent signals. Oftentimes, we have customers asking questions such as, what is typical RNA scope signal? And what does a dot mean? Does the dot size really matter? Why sometimes I see a cluster versus a dot? In this image, where RNA scope chromogenic red assay was performed, signal appears as numerous punctic red dots of different sizes and intensities and a few clusters. It is the number of dots and clusters that are important when it comes to signal quantification rather than the size of the dot or the intensity of the dot. Because each punctic dot equals to one mRNA molecule, either the small dot pointed by the blue arrow or the larger nicely round dot pointed by the yellow arrow is one mRNA molecule. The dot size depends on the number of ZZ probe pairs bind to a target sequence. Sometimes when the sample RNA quality is compromised and RNA sequence is fragmented, less ZZ can be bind, resulting in a smaller dot. But it still detects as one mRNA molecule, regardless of the dot size. Furthermore, a cluster pointed by the blue arrow is a result from overlapping signal dots from multiple mRNA molecules. The same concept also applies to RNA scope multiplex fluorescent assay. One dot represents a single copy of mRNA molecule the red arrow is pointing to a cluster of individual signal dots. We usually um, call this as a transcription hotspot. In general, our next scope data analysis method can be divided into two major categories, semi-quantitative, also known as manual scoring, or by quantitative image analysis software such as HALO. My colleague Amber, our image analysis scientist, will expand on the quantitative image analysis during her session. With the semi-quantitative approach, you may manually count the number of dots per cell and score the sample from 0 to 4 based on the scoring guideline shown here. For example, if you see 4 to 9 dots per cell with no or very few clusters, that is a score of 2, which is what we would like to see with positive control PPIB staining on most samples during sample QC. 
or if the staining shows more than 15 dots per cell and 10% of the dots are in clusters, you would then score the sample as 4. Similarly, the scoring guideline is also available for a multiplex fluorescent assay, as well as base scope assay. You may notice the base scope scoring guideline is slightly different from RNA scope assay in terms of number of dots per cell and the presence of cluster. This is because normally you will see much less signal dots with base scope assay as compared to RNA scope. As data analysis has always been one of the most inquired topics by customers, we have several resources available on our website aiming to provide more guidance to customers. One important document that you may want to check out is a reference guide which was developed by ACD scientists with examples of different scenarios of RNA scope staining and explaining how data can be analyzed in each scenario. Also, we have a tip note providing step-by-step -step instruction on how to analyze RNA scope and base scope data using ImageJ software, as well as a guideline on how to quantify fluorescent assay results. Besides different documents, you may be also interested in other previously recorded webinars on this exact topic of data analysis. For example, this webinar, the first one um, on the list, provides a live demo of using ImageJ software, as, whereas the last one listed here is a data interpretation webinar presented by our board certified pathologist. All the webinars are available through the link provided on this slide. Before wrapping up my session, I would like to mention that an optimal RNA scope staining is always the fundamental of data analysis. In order to get the most optimal staining, we always recommend running cell palette control provided by ACD to verify the assay setup and to conform the assay workflow when you are starting the assay for the very first time. Then running positive PPIV and negative DATB control probe to qualify your sample and to determine if the current assay condition is most optimal for any target detection. Here is the semi-quantitative score we would like to see in order to pass the sample. So for positive control PPIV staining, we would like to see a score of two and above. And for negative stat B control, we would like to see a score of less than one in order to pass a sample. Also, please feel free to contact ACD technical support team, and we are here to help you with any assay optimization questions. At the bottom of the slides is the ACD technical support email address. Please feel free to contact us. Here is an example of typical RNA scope experimental setup with proper controls as well as optimal target staining with nice punctic dots that can then be used for a subsequent image analysis. With this, I would like to pass the presentation to our imaging specialist, Sardar. Thank you. Thank you, Connie, for your nice introduction to the RNA scope assay. Hi, my name is Sardar Tulu. I'm imaging specialist at ACD. Now I will talk about how to take nice images because taking good quality images is essential to the image analysis. First, let me introduce you the differences between the bright field imaging and fluorescence imaging. 
We use bright field imaging in chromogenic assays and fluorescence imaging in fluorescent assays. One, one main difference between the, these two imaging modalities is the location of the light source. In bright field imaging, the light source is located on the other side of, of the specimen with respect to the detection. This means that the light goes through the specimen and enters the eyepiece. This gives a nice white background. On the other hand, in the fluorescence imaging, the light source is on the same side as the eyepiece. Light from the light source shines on the specimen and the fluorescent light from the specimen is detected by the eyepieces. This gives a nice and dark background. For image analysis, the image should have high contrast. Fluorescent images may have higher contrast because of the dark background and images should have high specificity for the mole molecule of interest to be able to perform a, the quantitative analysis. Next, I will continue to talk about the differences between these imaging systems and image analysis. For chromogenic assays, imaging is done easily using bright field microscopy technique. Here is one image but expertise is needed to be able to perform image analysis to separate each color. In fluorescence mic microscopy, expertise is needed to take the high quality images, but the image analysis is relative, relatively easier because the colors are already separated into different channels. So in chromogenic assays, imaging is easier, and in fluorescence assays, analysis is easier. In all cases, it is essential to take high quality images for image analysis. There are many image analysis softwares out there, but they are not magical to turn bad data into good data. If we start with a bad image data set, we should not expect to get good data out of them. When we start with nice set of images, we will get an analysis with much higher quality. Our aim here is to avoid bad imaging practices so that our image analysis will give a better and sound data. So, getting good images is essential. Here, I will touch upon the challenges in imaging. For bright field imaging, I will discuss false signal and color quality. For fluorescence imaging, I, go, I will go over autofluorescence and overexposure problems. These are the main challenges for a microscope user and an image analyst. Sometimes we jump over these challenges, you will see. Sometimes we go around, the, around them to pass, and sometimes we have to walk right into to break it. Let's start with challenges in bright field imaging for chromogenic assays and talk about the false signal. These images on the left are negative and positive control images. Connie showed these images earlier. We suggest to always include negative and positive control slides as they provide a point of reference. These images on the right are representative images that may give a false signal. For example, this image on top in the middle has a pink haze inherent to the tissue that has a similar color with our red assay, which you can see on the right. But with high quality images, we are able to distinguish, distinguish the colors between this pink haze and the red signal based on their intensity. There are other structures in the tissues that may have colors, like examples here on the bottom panels tar, lipofuscin, and melanin in skin. It is easier to separate this color from the red color, but they may be, uh, they may be difficult to separate from brown signal. So for these kinds of tissues, we do not advise brown assay. Another challenge in chromogenic image analysis is about the color quality. These two images you see here are the same region from a slide, but they are taken by two different scanners. At first glance, they may seem to be similar, but when we look at each dot closely, we start to see the differences. Scanner 1 
gives nice single color dots while the dots on the scanner too are multicolored. Image analysis is much easier with single color dots and it is difficult with multicolor dots. So the choice of a scanner or a microscope is very important to get good quality images. Next, let's move into the fluorescence imaging. One of the main challenges in fluorescence imaging is the autofluorescence. Here, you can see autofluorescence in different tissue types. Autofluorescence is intrinsic to the biological specimens. It should be excluded during image analysis, but this may not be always easy as it may be difficult to separate it from the real fluorescent signal. One way to distinguish if a signal comes from autofluorescence is to check if the same signal is present in different channels. That's because autofluorescence usually has a wide spectrum, which makes it visible through more than one channel. Autofluorescence may come from many different sources in the tissues like cofactors, amino, as amino acids, bilirubin, lipofuscin, collagen, elastin, etc. This graph on the right shows relative brightness of molecules in the tissues and the fluorescent dyes that are available. Amino acids like tryptophan has a high fluorescence or cofactor FMN is as bright as lucifer yellow. Other sources of autofluorescence may be as a result of tissue fixation and tissue over digestion because they may expose the fluorescent amino acids. It is important to get a nice fluorescence imaging without autofluorescence. Here are some tips to combat autofluorescence. We suggest to use fluorescent V2 assay, especially for autofluorescent tissues. It is possible to increase the fluorophore concentration in autofluorescent tissues. This will give a better signal to noise ratio. We suggest to assign the highest expressing, expressing gene to green channel. That's because most of the tissue autofluorescence tends to be in the green channel. If you have the equipment with multispectral imaging capability, you may be able to separate the autofluorescence from real signal. We always and always suggest to run a positive and a negative control. This makes it possible to compare the signals on stained and unstained tissues. At the end, if you still have questions, please do not hesitate to contact our support at support.acd at biotechni.com. Next issue that I will talk about is the overexposure. The image on top has pixels, and each pixel on the image has a value. When we plot a graph with these pixel values on the z-axis, we can see the signal as peaks in the image be below. Please notice the height differences between these three dots in the front and two dots in the back. We understand that two dots in the back have a lower fluorescence intensity. When we overexpose this image, all the dots become very high and we will lose this information. The difference between the intensities of the dots we can see that the background is also getting higher. In the worst cases, when there is no signal, it is possible to detect background fluorescence as if it is a real signal. In those cases, having a neg negative control would be very helpful. In general, fluorescence signal is based on excitation energy, fluorophore brightness, detection efficiency, detector sensitivity, and fluorophore concentration. Among these, du during our imaging, we can change the light intensity and exposure time to get a nice signal. Other parameters like light source, filter quality, objective quality, camera efficiency are based on the microscope setup, and they should be adjusted before the experiments. Lastly, we can change the fluorophore concentration when necessary during the experiments. This table here shows our recommendations for different fluorophores in V1 and V2 assays. 
Please refer to this table when you are designing your experiment. You can compare your system whether it is optimum for the dyes that you choose to use and the filter sets that you have. I would like to end our how to take best images section with a slide that summarizes the best practices. Before imaging during experimental design, we should make sure that we have the optimal filter combinations and the light source. And we have a good camera with high quantum efficiency. During imaging, we recommend to shine the light on the specimen only when you're observing the sample. We use DEPI channel in our, on our specimens to focus. We recommend to use minimum exposure time and excitation power and at the same time have a dynamic range as high as possible without overexposure. We suggest to first find an exposure time using positive control slides and then check the negative control slide and make sure that no signal is detected. If there is signal, you can lower the exposure time or excitation power such that there is signal in positive slides and no signal in negative slides. And finally, if possible, use the same exposure settings for the controls and marker stains. After you have taken an image, check it first. Make sure that there is no overexposed pixel and the image has a dynamic range. The intensity of the different channels are compatible with each other. This will help to minimize brightness and contrast manipulation. And finally, if you are using a slide scanner for multiple slides at once, check the other slides for fluorescence signal intensity at these settings. If the image has any of these problems, please go ahead and retake the image. If it is good, now you can anal analyze it. With this, I would like to pass the presentation to our image analyst scientist, Amber. Thank you, Sadar, for the wonderful introduction on how to acquire a quality image before beginning an image analysis. My name is Amber Jolly, and I am an image analysis scientist within Pharma Assay Services at ACD. In this session, I will review the basic requirements for image analysis of RNA scope and base scope data and provide an introduction to three commonly used software platforms ImageJ, Cell Profiler, and Halo by Indica Labs. Before we discuss some different approaches to take for image analysis, I have to provide a disclaimer. I want to emphasize that we provide data analysis guidelines for several types of RNA scope staining results, including semi-quantitative and quantitative analysis methods. For most applications, the approach of counting ish dots and calculating the number of dots per cell will be the most appropriate. As mentioned, the size of the dot is usually not biologically meaningful. However, for some applications, dot size and intensity may be relevant. It is ultimately the responsibility of the researcher to decide what is the most appropriate data analysis method. In this session, we will assume that we are dealing with typical RNA scope or base scope assay analysis. The goal will be to determine how many ish dots are associated with a given cell. We are making the assumption that dot size does not impact RNA scope score. Both a large and a small dot indicate the presence of one mRNA transcript. For example, both of these images shown here would be given a score of three, even though the dot size is different. Therefore, our goal is to bin cells according to the number of ish dots associated with each individual cell. Even though we have agreed on what the endpoint or readout for the data analysis should be, Keep in mind that every image analysis scientist will probably take a different path or route to ultimately reach the same final destination. So it is up to you to choose a method that makes the most sense and gives the most accurate readout. When we compare chromogenic and fluorescent image analysis approaches, we can see that the biggest difference between chromogenic and fluorescent image analysis is in the first color deconvolution step. This is because a chromogenic assay image is a mixture of many different colors that need to be separated according to single color channels. In this example, we have a typical RNA scope image on the top left hand corner. After color deconvolution has been applied, it is separated out into nuclear, probe, and background channels. 
The input parameters used to separate the channels will differ depending both on the software or algorithm used and also upon the choices made by the individual image analysis scientist, depending on which parameters they decide to use at the time. Color deconvolution results will therefore vary from user to user, and they will also depend a great deal on the quality of the camera or scanner used to acquire the image. With fluorescent images, on the other hand, the channels have been acquired separately already and are ready for individual analysis, making fluorescent images more consistent and easier to analyze. There are many different types of software available to analyze your data. Whichever software or approach you decide to take, the first goal is, to always, is always to identify objects in a given image. In our case, this will be either nuclei or ish dots. To identify objects, a number of modifications are made to the original image. This includes separation of channels, if chromogenic, removal of background noise, the application of appropriate image processing filters, and the application of segmentation algorithms. Once the objects have been identified, each object will possess a number of metadata associated with it, including its size, its shape, its location in the image, etc. Once we have identified objects, our goal for the RNA scope data analysis is to count the cells, separately to count the ish dots, and finally to calculate the number of ish dots per cell. If you have access to a more sophisticated image analysis software or workflow, we highly recommend taking the extra steps required to associate dots with the cell it belongs to and to bin the cells according to the number of dots per cell in order to then calculate the H score. The H score is related to the semi-quantitative scoring method. Just as in semi-quantitative binning, cells are grouped into five bins named bin 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4, according to the number of dots per cell. Each sample is evaluated for the percentage of cells in each bin, and the H score is calculated by totaling the percentage of cells in each bin according to the weighted formula shown. For example, in this scenario, we have 39% of the cells having 4 to 9 dots associated with the cell, putting it in bin 2. 39% of cells times bin 2 is then weighted by the bin. 5% of the cells land in bin 3. 5% of the cells have 10 to 15 dots associated with it. And this is therefore weighted by multiplying percentage 5 by bin 3. Finally, each of these are summed and the H score is given as the summation. In this case, we would expect an H score of 147 simply because we see most of the cells are landing somewhere between a bin of one or a bin of two. If 100% of the cells were in bin two, it would have an H score of 200. If 100% of the cells were in bin one, it would have an H score of 100. Since we have somewhere in between the two, we expect an H score of approximately 150, and this is what we're getting, 147. There are many different vendors who sell software for image analysis. There's also open source image analysis software available, which can be used to analyze your RNA scope and base scope image data. The two popular open source software platforms we promote here at ACD and have had success with in the past are ImageJ and Cell Profiler. If you would like to get started using the popular ImageJ software, also known as Fiji, we recommend using the most recent version, which can be accessed here. Please go to the ACD website and under the support tab, you will find a link to the ImageJ webinar led by Mohammed, which will walk you through the steps required to perform an analysis of a singleplex chromogenic assay. Before you begin, please download the Color Deconvolution plugin and the Weka classifier. Please also note that there is a tech note associated with this webinar, and we have added a few addenda to this tech note, which will be available on the ACD website when this webinar recording is uploaded. The addenda will include instructions on how to adjust the ImageJ workflow to analyze duplex chromogenic RNA scope and base scope images, as well as how to analyze fluorescent RNA scope assays using ImageJ. Cell Profiler is another popular open source software available for image analysis. Cell Profiler has the advantage of providing published pipelines provided by manuscript authors on their website, and these are available to the public. You can download the Cell Profiler software here. To access the published pipelines, 
used previously to analyze RNA scope and base scope images, please go to the published pipeline section, scroll down until you see a list of publications and you find this particular publication, Urban et al., a novel ultra-sensitive in-situ hybridization approach to detect short sequences and splice variants with cellular resolution in molecular neurobiology, published in 2017. Underneath that reference, there is a button, a clickable button that says download. Click on the download, it will give you a zip file. Within that zip file, there will be two different pipelines, which you can use. One pipeline is called base scope quantification.cp pipe. The other one is called multiplex RNA scope quantification.cp pipe. Please remember to adjust the bins to your assay. For example, if you're using an RNA scope assay, you need to adjust the bins if you if the platform of the um, pipeline is a base scope pipeline. You'll also need to treat your pipelines as a starting point and a framework to use, which you will then need to adjust to your specific images. If you're interested in learning more about Cell Profiler to analyze your RNA scope and base scope assays, please join me for a Cell Profiler webinar on July 23rd, 2019. Here at ACD, we use Halo software by Indica Labs for all of our data analysis needs within Pharma Assay Services. If you'd like to learn more about Halo software, you can find the information on this uh, link, info at indicalab.com. And we encourage you to refer back to this slide if you would like more information on the HALO software. When we are going to compare the data output between the three different softwares mentioned here, if you are simply to follow exactly the instructions that we provide to you, you would come with the following data output. Using the ImageJ software, you would be able to calculate total cell count and total probe dot count and the average dots per cell. With Cell Profiler, you would get the same information as ImageJ with the additional benefit of also being able to calculate the percent positive cells and percent dual or triple positive cells. If you were to use Halo, you can also get all of these uh, pieces of information, but additionally, you would be provided with an H score and the binning for every single cell that is analyzed. And I should also note that if it's applicable to your assay, all of these platforms will be able to provide you with size, intensity, and area of the ish dots. I also should mention that you are uh, free to expand upon what we provide to you. And in fact, it is not uh, impossible to be able to calculate an H score using ImageJ software. It would just take some more time on your part to develop that workflow. Here at PAS, uh, we provide an entire uh, full service to our clients. We provide comprehensive support to both global pharma and to biotech partners. Our services include tissue sectioning, performing the RNA scope or base scope assay, scanning, scoring, and image analysis. Our pharma assay services team is comprised of highly trained specialists, scientists, and board certified pathologists. We provide formal reports and presentations of our findings and our approach is to communicate with our clients throughout the process to tailor our services to your unique needs. When the PAS team prepares slides for HALO analysis, we frequently use a 3D HISTEC scanner, although we may use other scanners depending upon the assay requirements. The 3D HISTEC scanner gives us high quality images for our analysis. Based on the unique specs of our scanner, including its ability to excite some fluorophores more than others, we use these guidelines shown here to get the most out of our imaging system. We prefer to put the lowest expressing RNA in Opal 17, excuse me, Opal 570, the highest expressor with Opal 520, and the medium level expressor with Opal 690. For the chromogenic duplex assay, we follow the same practice we recommend to all our clients, which is to put the highest expressor in the green channel regardless of the type of imaging system being used, and this is because of the way the chromogenic assay is designed. The PAS team is able to provide semi-quantitative analysis of all of our assays, including singleplex chromogenic, duplex chromogenic, and multiplex fluorescent assays. The semi-quantitative analysis is a form of informed visual scoring based on a set of standardized criteria shown here, and which was earlier described by Connie. 
It is important to remember that the scoring criteria is different for RNA scope and base scope assays because fewer ZZ pairs are used in base scope assays, and these assays show fewer and larger dots than the RNA scope assays. The HALO analysis workflow involves first assigning regions of interest to analyze. This may be a specific anatomical region within the tissue, such as the epidermis of the skin or the retina of the eye, for example, or it may be a pathological region, region such as those containing a high degree of inflammatory infiltrate, or um, in this example, we have uh, the necessity to divide the tissue into tumor versus stroma. In this example here, we see that there are these two different ROIs are defined and then after halo analysis is performed to identify nuclei and RNA scope-ish dots and included in the workflow is a review by a pathologist to validate the region of interest or ROI determination before the data is quantified and ultimately presented in graphical form. In this example, it is clear that there is a difference in expression of these two genes in the stroma versus in the tissue regions. And importantly, this difference would not have been picked up if the entire tissue was analyzed as if it were a homogeneous expression, or if the tumor and stroma regions had not been classified correctly. One of the perks of using the HALO software is the ability to take advantage of machine learning techniques to classify tissues for the purpose of defining regions of interest for tissue subsectioning and analysis. This tool is most helpful when there are distinct regions within a tissue, especially in cases of tumor versus stroma, as shown here. We use the information in the unique image to train the classifier within the HALO software and to validate our classifications with the help of our pathologist. The workflow that we use in order to use the HALO software to identify nuclei and to identify ish dots and ultimately to calculate the H score using the HALO software is as follows. The first step is to determine the nuclear outline. The way we do this is, al is always to perform the color deconvolution first. The color deconvolution will separate out the nuclear channel from the ish dot channel. After the nuclear channel has been identified using color deconvolution in a chromogenic image, we then are able to detect nuclear edges using a combination of thresholding parameters, including the intensity and contrast, as well as the size and segmentation adjust adjustments. This allows us to identify individual nuclei as unique ROIs or regions of interest. And this identification is quality controlled by visual inspection of multiple PAS scientists. The next step is then to identify cytoplasm outlines. The way that this is done is mathematically. What is done is that we set the cell radius in pixels and a cell perimeter is drawn using the nuclear outlines. The cell perimeters are propagated out at that set radius length and the perimeters are equally distributed amongst overlapping cells such that pixels are never assigned to more than one cell. We also uh, will perform quality control of the cell outlines by visual inspection by multiple PAS scientists. The, end, the last bit of our workflow is the ish dot identification step. For this, we also start with the color deconvolution to get our initial image of the ish dots. Ish dot edge detection using OD and contrast thresholding is then performed similar to the nuclear identification. Size filters and segmentations are also applied. And once we identify ish spots, we associate them automatically with the cell, that is with the actual cell perimeter or cytoplasm. Although it is possible to associate only with the nucleus. Quality control of the dot identification is also done by visual inspection. One of the biggest questions that comes up when we talk about how to analyze our RNA scope and base scope data is knowing whether or not what you're looking at is a single dot or a cluster of multiple dots and hence multiple mRNA transcripts. The way that we do this is very um, visual and mathematical when we do our, our quantitative image analysis. We can simply say that one dot is one peak or one foci, whereas a cluster has multiple peaks or multiple foci, regardless of the size. Within HALO, we use the ISH uh, module, 
And what this does is it allows all dots to be detected in the method previously described. And so therefore all of the dots are included in the analysis. The user puts inputs the maximum dot size with the knowledge that a base scope dot is going to be larger than an RNA scope dot. Any dot that is greater than what the user or we input as the maximum is counted as more than one dot. For example, shown here, a red dot or region of interest is considered larger than the maximum size and is therefore segmented according to the size. Therefore, based on the size, a red dot shown here will be segmented into two or more ish dots. The process that we perform is very similar for fluorescent images with the wonderful exception of the first color deconvolution step being avoided. In this workflow, similarly, we start out with our nuclear outline detection. We can simply assign the DAPI channel for the nuclear detection. We can then perform contrast thresholding as well as size and roundness filters and nuclear segmentation adjustments. This is how we then identify nuclei as individual ROIs. And we perform quality control by visual inspection. In exactly the same way, we propagate out the cell perimeter in order to determine the cell cytoplasm outlines. And this is quality controlled by visual inspection. The ish dots are determined by taking that particular probe fluorescent channel, assigning it with its correct name, and then performing the same similar contrast thresholding and providing the HALO software with minimum intensity for dots, as well as minimum and maximum sizes for dots, and to perform signal size and segmentation aggressiveness thresholding. It is therefore important that the image itself is acquired in a very informed way, as was mentioned by Siddhar. And finally, we perform quality control by visual inspection. In the case of the fluorescent assays, the method is quite similar in order to distinguish a dot from a cluster. Here again, one dot is identified by being one peak or having one foci, whereas a cluster is identified by having multiple peaks or foci. We have a few tools to play with when we perform halo analysis, which allows us to differentiate between a dot and a cluster. The main tools are the ability to tell the software the number of dots per cluster by inputting the expected signal size and also by modulating the dot segmentation aggressiveness. When we perform halo analysis on fluorescent images especially, we have to be very careful not to oversaturate the images. In this example here, the dot on the right appears to be a single dot, but the one on the left appears to possibly be two overlapping dots. The way that this is apparent is because it seems to be an asymmetrical distribution of pixels. However, it is difficult to tell for this dot on the left because the middle pixels are all saturated. The difference between a dot and a cluster is very important to our analysis, so overexposure of an image will affect our ability to accurately distinguish between a large dot versus a cluster of dots. After HALO analysis has been completed, Pharma Assay Services will create a report including scanned images of all the assay tissues, as well as the physical slides and an Excel file containing all of the data for every tissue and every cell in every region of interest analyzed. The Excel file will include the total cell count in each region of interest, the number of probe copies per cell, the number of cells in each bin used to calculate the H score, the H score for each probe, and the percent dual or triple positive as applicable. We provide bar graphs for the percent of cells that are positive for your probe of interest, as well as bar graphs for the H scores for each probe, and can also provide heat maps of tissues or arrays for ease of visual data interpretation. We encourage you to reach out to support and to let us know how the PAS team at ACD can best serve you. And we are always happy to discuss assay design and will help you get the most out of your assay by taking advantage of our RNA scope and base scope data analysis expertise.
With that, I would like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. My colleagues are still on the line to help address your questions, so please feel free to continue sending your questions through. Again, as a reminder, this webinar is recorded and will be available on our website. In the event you were not able to get a question sent through the Q&A uh, section, um, I'm leaving up the contact information for technical support, so please feel free to send questions uh, to us by emails here or call us at this 1877 number. Thank you so much. Please also stay online for a little bit longer as I will be sharing some frequently asked questions in the next slide. Thank you again for your time attending this webinar. We'll see you again at our next month's support webinar. Thank you.